贵贵宾播放主席及台北驻波兰代表处长官已经上线。Good morning, Vice Chairman Kudosko and Ambassador Shi Shi Da Shi. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Chairman Huang and our guests are ready for our webinar today. 我们现在请黄副理事长与播放主席及施大使打声招呼。Hello， 嗨，大家好。大家好 ，Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you. Hi， 有没有空 ？Thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us. 好，我们紧接着请台方主席、国经协会黄博志副理事长致开幕词。Now we will first like to welcome Mr. Fred Huang, Vice Chairman of Chinese International Economic Cooperation Association, to deliver his opening remarks. Vice Chairman Huang, please. Thank you. Well, Mr. Kotzko, the Vice President, Polish Chamber of Commerce, and Ambassador Xi, Representative and Head of Office, Taipei Representative Office in Poland, and Mr. Rich, Acting Head of Office, Polish Office in Taipei, and Ms. Tai. Secretary General, Bureau of Foreign Trade, Ministry of Economic Affairs, and Mr. Dewandowski, Head of the Non-European Countries Unit, Department of International Trade, Ministry of Economic Development, Labor and Technology. Distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to friends in Taiwan, and good morning, Gian Dobler, to friends in Poland. It is my pleasure to co-chair this 16th Taiwan-Poland Joint Business Council meeting with Mr. Kosko on behalf of CECA. I would like to give our sincere thanks to all the participants for joining us today. We plan to have delegation to visit Poland and attend the Joint Business Council meeting this year. However, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is difficult to travel overseas. Although COVID-19 limits our face-to-face -face meetings, this virtual conference still allows us to continue our dialogue and discussions on potential cooperation between our two business community. From our experience, this kind of internet virtual Confidence even attracts more listeners, more friends to visit us because it is easier to join this meeting. The impact of the pandemic on Taiwan has been fairly limited thanks to our government effective measures in containing this. Pandemic, our GDP growth rate this year is expected to be 1.56 percent, and normal daily life such as going to restaurants, domestic tourism, and even sports events have largely resumed. Although Taiwan has contained the Coronavirus. We have not forgotten our friends abroad. In April, Taiwan sent Poland half a million facial mask in a gesture of solidarity. Also, the academic syndicate in Taiwan held discussions with the Polish Academy and of Science via video. 
conference to share Taiwan's experience in fighting the COVID-19 coronavirus disease. Through both donations and industrial corporations, we hope to strengthen our relations with Poland. Next, I would like to introduce some sessions for today's meeting. Today, we have honored to have the following speakers from Taiwan to share, to share their valuable insights with us. First, Mr. Chen Chung Yi Liang, Zhong Liang, CEO of Institute for Biotechnology and Medicine Industry. And then Dr. Lin Chung Xu, PhD Research Fellow, Deputy Director, Center for Green Economy, Tsinghua Institution for Economic Research. And Ms. Sunny Di, Senior Sales Manager, Electric Vehicle Changing Solution, BU Delta Electronic Incorporation. And later on, speakers from both sides will enlighten us with their views on prospects of medical epidemic prevention, green energy, and electromobility development in both communities during their speeches. In conclusion, finally, I would like to thank you and all the friends online at this moment, again, for your participation and support. I hope these sessions will provide opportunities for further cooperation between Taiwan and Poland. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Huang. And next, we would like to welcome Mr. Marek Klosko, Vice President and Direct General of Polish Chamber of Commerce, to give his opening remarks. Mr. Klosko, please. Dear President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, great honor to take part in this thing, Taiwan Poland Joint Business Council. First of all, I would like to address my Mr. Fred Huang, Vice Chairman and Chinese International Economic Cooperation Association, and his employees for organizing this event together with Polish Chamber of Commerce for the 16th time already, but uh, the first time online. Secondly, I would like to welcome everyone in the Polish business representatives and to thank all the distinguished guests and panelists who devote their time to be here today. Polish Taiwanese economic relations have been improving, especially in recent years, but uh, in our opinion, those relations remain in place uh, despite the huge potential and capacity of our countries. They are relatively small and not intense enough. So Polish Chamber of Commerce is trying to do its best to support Polish businesses in exploring the Taiwanese market and to promote Poland among Taiwanese companies. And these are the industries we are going to discuss today. I think the one of the greatest potential of cooperation is in the healthcare, electromobility, and green energy. So they are the topics for today in business and business of Poland and Taiwan. In sum, uh, we hope for intensification of bilateral relations and wish you all a fruitful network and we are waiting for all of you in Poland and Poland in the near future. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Mr. Klosko. 那么接下来欢迎台北驻波兰代表处施文斌大使为我们致辞。And now we would like to welcome Ambassador Weber, Shi Representative and Head of Office of Taipei Representative Office in Poland. Shi 大使，请。Mr. Huang, Chairman Bosco, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, 大家好，金少伯。It is my honor to be part of today's important event. Firstly, I want to wish you all healthy with high spirit in facing the COVID-19 pandemic, and express my special thanks to Chairman Huang and Chairman Bosco. As well as your colleagues, for the joint effort to make today's event possible. People have been prevented from exchanging visits since the outbreak of the pandemic, but the obstacles have never limited our ability and capacity for turning challenges into opportunities. This year's Taiwan Forum Ministerial Consultation Group video conference. On September 15th, has a prioritized key sector for pursuing our further work. The next meeting is a follow-up to the ministerial consultation. Experts will give people statistics on medical advantage prevention, green energy, and electrical mobility, and the potential partners of the sectors will join the business network. I'm convinced that through today's presentation and B2B discussions, opportunities for our further cooperation will become more tangible. We will continue to stand ready to join you in making this happen together. In closing, this day's event and success. Wish you all the best. I thank you. Thank you, Shi 大使 Thank you, Ambassador Shi. Thank you. And next, we would like to welcome Mr. Bartosz Rees, acting head of office of Polish office in Taipei, to give his address. Mr. Rees, please. Dear Vice Chairman Huang, dear Vice President Kwoczko, dear Ambassador Shi. Dear Secretary General Day, distinguished guests, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you at the 16th Taiwan-Poland Joint Business Council meeting and Taiwan-Poland Business Networking. This year has been marked by the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, which seriously affected everyday life of everyone. Despite the pandemic, Poland and Taiwan relations. Remained strong. In September, we conducted a high-level dialogue, namely the ninth economic consultations led by the deputy ministers of economy. During the consultations, we signed two cooperation agreements. This year, Polish national airline Lot launched first ever direct and passenger charter flight between Poland. And Taiwan between Warsaw and Taipei. We hope that in the future, this will become a regular、uh, connection. Poland remains a popular destination for Taiwanese students pursuing medical education. Currently, there are around 1,000 students from Taiwan studying at the Polish medical universities. We are immensely proud that Taiwanese students choose Poland to obtain their medical degree. At the same time, many Polish people come to Taiwan to study Mandarin and learn about the local culture. These people-to-people -people contacts lay solid foundations for our future cooperation. The global pandemic did not affect our bilateral trade; quite the opposite. In the first half of 2020, bilateral trade between Poland and Taiwan grew by almost six percent. On a year-on-year -year basis, I am deeply convinced that there are still many possibilities for further expansion of the mutually beneficial cooperation, especially in the areas of healthcare, green energy, and startups. 
Distinguished guests, on behalf of Polish Office in Taipei, I would like to wish you a successful meeting and many business opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rees. 接下来我们邀请经济部国际贸易局戴婉容主任秘书为我们致辞。And now we would like to welcome Mr. Ms. Amelia Day, Secretary General of Bureau of Foreign Trade and MOEA, to give her address. 戴主秘，请。Vice Chairman Huang of the Chinese Inter International Economic Cooperation Association, Representative Xi from the Taipei Representative Office in Poland, Mr. Bartosz uh, Rich, Acting Head of the Office from the uh, Polish Office in Taipei, Mr. Marek Kursko, Vice President, Polish Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Uh, Bartumiet Lewandowski, Head of Non-European Countries Unit, Department of International Trade, Ministry of Economic Development, Labor and Technology. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, I'm very pleased that the 16th Taiwan-Poland Joint Business Council meeting is able to break through the impact of uh, the pandemic and be smoothly conducted uh, today by a video. This shows how highly uh, our bilateral industry participants regard this platform. Taiwan and Poland have uh, actively explored and promoted industrial cooperation and emerging and key industries through various sectors. In this year's Poland-Taiwan economic consultation, we discuss investment, cooperation, electric vehicles, and uh, cybersecurity. Today, we will discuss medical and pandemic prevention, green energy, and electric mobility, which are related to those issues we explored at the previous consultation. Especially regarding electric mobility, Poland is a major producer of electric vehicles and electric bus batteries in Europe. And Taiwan is now promoting the full electrification of urban buses by 2030. Therefore, we look forward to exploring opportunities for joint cooperation between Taiwanese and the policy industries. Moreover, moreover, in order to understand the needs of our businesses for government assistance in bilateral trade and investment in foreign countries, the Bureau of Foreign Trade and the CIRCA organized the first Taiwan Europe V4 with the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Slo Slovakia business networking meeting in July. Today's business networking continue to serve as a communication platform between our government and the business communities to continue injecting momentum into strengthening bilateral trade as well as investment and technological cooperation. Since the outbreak of pandemic this year, the Polish Agency for Enterprise Development and the Taiwan External Trade Development Council, TITRA, jointly held a B2B video conference on information technology and uh, healthcare in August. Clearly, the pandemic didn't hinder the economic and the trade exchanges between our respect, respective industries. The European Union has selected six important and leading strategic industries for new business models. Likewise, Taiwan, Taiwan's uh, six, core, six core strategic industries program are highly compatible with those of the EU. Thus, we hope that in the future, Taiwan and Poland can enhance cooperation in these areas, explore business opportunities for both parties and create win-win outcomes. Since we now all face drastic economic changes and accelerate the reorganization of supply chains, the global deployment of industries and the development of potential markets take on high priority. Therefore, I hope that Taiwan and Poland will continue to use the exchange mechanism of the JBC and the business networking 
to deepen mutual understanding of our respective industries and further de develop opportunities for bilateral cooperation. Finally, I'm confident that today's event will be fruitful and I, w I would like to wish all of you good health and success. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Day. And next, we would like to welcome Mr. Bar Bartomir Lewandowski, Head of Non-European Country Unit, Department of International Trade, Ministry of Economic Development, Labor and Technology, to give his address. Mr. Lewandowski, please. Hello, Mr. Minister, gentlemen. First of all, I would like to welcome and to thank the organizers, President Fred Kwan and President Marek Kwoczko, as well as their teams for arranging the 16th Thailand Poland Joint Business Council meeting. I really appreciate that even in this difficult time, the JBC meeting plays an important role in facilitating the cooperation between Polish and Taiwanese business community. 2020 is a very specific year. The COVID-19 pandemic dominated the world's economy and affected all sectors of human activity. Let me use this opportunity to congratulate the undisputed success the Taiwanese government and society achieved in combating the pandemic, both in health and economic dimension. As you probably know, Poland is still struggling with the second wave of COVID-19 Nevertheless, it is predicted that our economy will be the least affected by the crisis among the European ones. On the other hand, this difficult situation brought Poland and Taiwan even closer to each other. As it was mentioned, this year, first ever direct cargo and passenger flights have been launched between Warsaw and Taipei. Also, our bilateral trade has not been affected negatively. It grew by more than 5% after three quarters this year. Uh, it also been mentioned that on September 15th, one Polish Taiwan economic consultation were held. Both sides exchanged view on a range of issues, including investment, trade, and collaboration in electric mobility, cybersecurity, and smart cities. However, both sides agreed that only the further exploration of B2B relations between Polish and Taiwanese companies and make a real difference and put us at the next level. I am both glad and grateful that despite the odds caused by pandemic, Polish Chamber of Commerce and Chinese International Economic Cooperation Association took an initiative in this regard. Let me conclude by wishing each and every one of you a successful and fruitful deliberation. I hope that that today's JBC meeting will allow entrepreneurs from both sides to identify the various business opportunities and consequently affect positively the investment and trade relations between our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewandowski. Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed to our keynote speech today, we would like to invite our VIPs to take an online group photo. Please to get the webcam on your iPad for the group photo. Okay, I think that we're all set. Uh请各位贵宾稍待几秒钟 的时间, please hold on for a few seconds. On my count, three, two, one, cheese. Okay, that's good. 请各位贵宾再次给我们一个赞, please once again give us a thumbs up to wish today's event a great, great success. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we would now like to begin our first session today focusing on medical and epidemic prevention. And we will first like to welcome Mr. Tian Zongliang, CEO of Institute for Bio, uh, Biotechnology and Medicine Industry. Okay, thank you for the uh, moderator. Uh, my name is Zhong Liang Qian. Actually, I'm a professor in the National Taiwan University, NTU. Um, 
It's my honor to, uh, and the pleasure to give a talk today. The topic of, uh, of my talk is looking beyond the COVID-19, the healthcare ecosystem in Taiwan. Um, the next slide is controlled by myself. Okay, I got it. First, let me give you a brief introduction of pandemic's background of COVID-19 the worldwide spread of novel coronavirus that caused severe acute respiratory syndrome, we call SARS, in 2003, proceeded with rapidly overwhelming problems in many hospitals and the public health system in the matter of weeks in Taipei. There are 774 deaths caused by the SARS of the world in 2003, and there are 73 deaths in Taiwan at that time, almost 10% of the world. We got lessons from that. For the future strategy to control the spread of the coronavirus, we need to emphasize the greater risk to certain populations, especially like healthcare workers, senior citizens, and the people who have chronic disease. Besides that, the isolation of cases, stringent infection control in the hospitals, and the attentive, uh, attentive surveillance for the community is a very important. For COVID-19 uh, pandemic up to today, Taiwan did a very good job. So far, I think less than 608 cases uh, yesterday reported, and uh, only seven deaths in Taiwan. Comparing to the 55 million cases and the 1.3 million deaths in the world. So you can get the information that Taiwan really did a good job. And I'll just show you one more information. This, uh, just take a look at the progress report about the macro and economic outcomes and the COVID-19 re released by the Stanford uh, recently, actually just last, uh, last month, we can see Taiwan's position at the bottom of the GTP loss scale, very uh, almost below the zero. And how about the Poland? Of, of course, you can see our uh, death rate is pretty low, almost lowest in the world. How about the Poland position? You can see I mark it in the red uh, position over there. Poland did a very good also comparing to the other European countries such as uh, Spain, France, UK, or Ita Italy. Uh, you can see the upper part. So Poland actually did a very good too. The success of Taiwan for anti-epidemic measures include the creed response and the efficient management and central production and the distribution of face masks. This is also a very great contribution from the Ministry of Economy Affairs. Besides that, the quarantine, isolation, the regulation with tracking contact technology and the coordination between the government, medical workers, public health professional, and the whole Taiwanese society. Actually, the last part, we have to appreciate that. Our society, every Taiwanese, have their contribution. You can see our school keep open, our business keep running. Really amazing, right? In the world, I think most of our, uh, I think most of you would have agreed that Taiwan has successful and keep the virus at the bay and manage the business as usual. Okay, so we have the successful story. And this is just now the good time for Taiwan to set the eyes on the new markets where we used to find the difficult to get access to, especially like a European country. In several hospitals have deep root in a few Southeast Asia countries, such as Thailand, Vietnam, but less known as well, like a EU, like a Euro Europe and give opportunities and uh, uh, challenges may be diff 
different country by, diff, uh, by country, Taiwan has to offer solutions such as diagnostic, infectious control, clinical guidelines, spa hospital, and the data-driven medical care development, in addition to the COVID-19 know-how, how to. Taiwan is, it is indispensable to the global healthcare supply chain and market with solution and application derived from the fighting of COVID-19 experience. Taiwan could provide with appropriate social solution for the healthcare sectors of Poland. We believe so. And what's the solution? Before I give you the answer, let me give you, uh, just provide more evidence from Taiwan medicine and the ICT fields for you. This is the advantage of Taiwan uh, medicine. Taiwan has an outstanding healthcare insurance system. More than 99% of our population are covered by the national health insurance. By way of the high quality healthcare service, we are ranking as the third in the world in terms of medical service quality. Besides that, our national health insurance research database has been collected more than 22 years. We call big data. This is really important. And the medical center keep the complete medical records such as the image data, like a CT scan, X-ray scan, those image data. So we have the big data as well as real world data for healthcare. We call the real world data kept in the hospital. So as you may know, the Taiwan ICT industry is also pretty strong. We have ICT cluster in the science parks with rich manufacturing experience and outstanding technologies. In addition, we have we have high level of hardware software integration capability for the flexible production and rapid commercialization. This is the most important part and the, the critical part for Taiwan's, uh, for the ICT uh, sectors. We have really flexible. Okay, so I give you the medicine and ICT. What's the combination? In recent years, Taiwan tried to bring hospital together with ICT industry as well as the biopharmaceuticals to cross fertilize their idea and develop better solution for patients. Because we have the world-class medical service team such as microsurgery, liver transplantation, together with, the, with complete ICT supply chain to provide the key components, and combining all this advantage, Taiwan could deliver small hospitals, healthcare, Internet of Things, health AI, medical and mobile device, as well as hospital equipment to the global markets, especially for Poland. This is the one kind of total solution, especially the small hospital. I will give you more detail about the small hospital. Uh, you can see there's a lot of company. Based on the Internet of Things, 5G, AR, VR, cloud computing, and the blockchain are the backbones of the fascinating uh, countless economy after COVID-19. People keep a distance, countless. ICT giants from Taiwan have long been in this area and most recently ventured it into healthcare business. You can see the, uh, sorry, it's kind of busy, but you can see a lot of company, now they join the healthcare business. You may be familiar with certain names here as hardware manufacturers, such as PC Maker, Asus, Acer, and the vast majority of them work with the healthcare sectors like hospital, not just for the device and the equipment, more and more for the software, 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 or what is called total solution, the integration of hardware and software together. 
for the hospital, like a BenQ, um, uh, Advantech, they did a very good job. I just give you one more info, uh, example, like a BenQ. BenQ, they did a very good in Thailand. Actually, I went together with uh, Zhanghua Christian Hospital and the BenQ, the, the, the representative from the uh, Christa, we went to Bangkok last year and we sell this total solution for the uh, Thailand, uh, for the hospital in Thailand. The BenQ, they are working closely to the hospital. I just mentioned like a Zhanghua Christian Hospital to deliver fantastic technology or solution for the digital health care. And they are now providing the total solution for small operation room. You know, the small operation room need a LED light, need a surgical monitor. That's the original that uh, uh, Bank you who made it. So they are pretty strong about the small hospital. So uh, they provide this um, to get work together with uh, uh, hospital. So uh, I have to move it fast. This is the example, the small hospital, including the small operation room, small clinics, small counters, everything together within one small hospital. This is one of good example. Okay, because my time is very limited, I just give you a, a short introduction of our organization, IBMI. Um, we have the uh, program supported by the Ministry of Health in Taiwan, we call Taiwan Healthcare Trust. And we will have the Taiwan Healthcare Expo at the end of this year, actually uh, will be the December 3rd to de December 6th. Um, I don't have time to run the movie. Please just Google it. The Expo Taiwan dash healthcare.org. You can see a lot of movies from our biotech company, from our medical centers. They will join our expos. And I sincerely welcome all the uh, people from Poland. If you couldn't come to this year, we sincerely welcome you come to next year. So uh, just welcome you to Taiwan and know what we are doing about our healthcare business. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Qian. We thank the And next, we would like to welcome Mr. Marcin Yaskula, CEO of Novi Biotech. Mr. Yaskula, please. Good afternoon to our um, speakers and our guests here in Taiwan. Good morning, dzień dobry, to our um, speakers and guests in Poland. My name is uh, Marcin Jasku. I'm a CEO of Tobi Biotech Corporation. We are a small Polish-Japanese biotech startup with some operations in Taiwan. As uh, Dr. Chen already mentioned uh, during his presentation, um, the, the initial information about <clears throat> the COVID-19 uh, situation that we are all facing globally, I would like, you, I would like to um, <clears throat> just briefly go through the lessons that we can draw from the Taiwanese experience and implement in Poland, because it would be inappropriate for the Taiwanese to lecture Polish how to handle the pandemic. So I decided to take this challenge upon myself. If you don't mind, I'll try to be brief. Okay, so some uh, starting points, um, how it all started. The WHO um, was first alerted to a novel coronavirus outbreak by Chinese authorities on the 31st of December. Um, 2019, I was actually in Taiwan at that moment. <clears throat> uh, in the following weeks, an increasing number of cases and deaths were reported outside China, which was the epicenter, as we all know, in Wuhan, prompting WHO to declare COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern on 30th of January 2020 and a pandemic on March mm, 12, 2020. So what is this? What is the situation at the moment? As of uh, yesterday, we have some data. The total number of cases, uh, the difference between the numbers between Poland and Taiwan is pretty astonishing. In Poland, as of yesterday, we had 
773,000 active cases and 11,451 deaths, uh, comparing to Taiwan with only 607 cases and seven deaths. Why Taiwan, why Taiwan has done uh, so much better than Poland? The secret of Taiwan's success lies in the painful memories of 2003 SARS outbreak. Uh, it was also caused by a um, type of coronavirus, uh, and it was a direct uh, predecessor, predecessor of, of the COVID-19. Uh, even the name of the current coronavirus that was uh, the red havoc across the globe, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is derived from the SARS-CoV coronavirus identified in 2003 as the cause of SARS. So a bit more on the 20, uh, 2003 um, outbreak in Taiwan. Mm, the SARS epidemic uh, of 2003 affected 26 countries and resulted in more than 8,000 cases and nearly 800 deaths worldwide. And Taiwan was uh, the, the most hit uh, by this uh, outbreak. Ob obviously, as you can see, uh, comparing the numbers, um, the current, the current outbreak is, 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 is much, much larger. Um, Taiwan reported 31 deaths and um, one hospital alone in Taipei had to handle 154 cases, which is comparing to, to the current uh, pandemic of COVID-19 uh, quite, quite, quite low. The lessons that Taiwan drew from the 2003 um, well-trained and experienced public health officials were quick to recognize the crisis and launch an emergency public health response to contain the emerging outbreak. Um, there was an establishment of the National Health Command Center, led obviously by a Minister of Health. Um, there were hubs for a number of smaller centers uh, um, uh, charged with res responding to the epidemics, biological pathogens, bioterrorism, and medical emergencies. Taiwan expanded their surveillance net to include anyone who had traveled to Wuhan in the pr previous two weeks. By January 20th, the government uh, activated the Central Epidemic Command Center and charged with coordinating all government efforts to combat the growing health crisis. In an effort to contain the epidemic, Taiwan employed the most powerful tools at its disposal, uh, big data and analytics. Obviously, the issue of masks uh, uh, is pretty, it was pretty visible. Um, wearing masks and putting emphasis on medical care were two crucial keys to Taiwan's success in preventing COVID-19 spread. In Poland and other European countries, um, it was generally believed that only infected patients need to wear a mask and that wearing a mask implies admission of disease. Obviously, we uh, in Europe, and especially in Poland, had never had to face a pandemic before, so the people were not used to wearing masks, uh, they, were, they, they could only see uh, medical professional, uh, professionals wearing masks in a hospital environment and stuff. There was never uh, a view of people wearing masks on the streets. So this was something completely new to us. And I know it's hard to be believe and hard to understand for the Taiwanese, but this was the reality. So on the point of lessons for Poland, um, the key strategies to Im implement immediately uh, that I think our government uh, should, 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 should learn from the Taiwanese experience, especially starting with the operational structure, um, having one uh, uh, subject, one platform for, for the coordination, I think uh, is extremely crucial and important. Uh, as we could see in Taiwan, the Taiwan CDC was, was, was coordina coordinating the effort of um, managing and, and preventing the pandemic uh, uh, to, to spread. Uh, CDC, um, uh, the Central Epidemic uh, Command Center, was established uh, in, on January 20th to integrate resources and administration, the academic uh, field, medical, and private sectors to fight the 2019 novel coronavirus. We could all see it, the, 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 the effort, the joint effort of Taiwanese business uh, and government, uh, especially in, in, in terms of production of PPE masks, uh, so on and so forth. Then legislation, very important uh, factor of, of managing the pandemic and, 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 and being, and being a, step, a step um, uh, f forward. Um, obviously, um, uh, strong legal acts, 
the, the Communicable Disease Control Act in Taiwan, for example, classified COVID-19 as a Category 5 communicable disease on January 15th. As we all know, pandemics um, uh, will, um, will be in our lives uh, in, in the future. I don't think this is the last pandemic that we are facing, so a strong legal framework is ex extremely important. Of, of future management and control, obviously uh, pandemics being a threat to national security of, of all the countries um, uh, as, we, as, as we go on. Uh, then prevention strategies, obviously, um, uh, we, have to, we have to come up with, uh, with, with strategies that will uh, um, uh, enable us to, to fight the future, the future potential uh, threats caused by the pandemics, surveillance, uh, being uh, very important, uh, laboratory diagnostics, uh, medical system uh, uh, has to be ready, the medical system response and preparedness, obviously, um, the stockpile and allocation of PPE, uh, which, is, which is a huge, uh, a huge, uh, 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 hugely important thing for the governments to consider uh, to build their um, national security framework, obviously. Um, Then obviously the control of community tran transmission is very important. So um, obviously, uh, you know, education and, and, and preparing the public for what's to come. Uh, it's, it's very important that, that the public uh, works together with the government. Mm, uh, the quarantine uh, uh, being taken seriously uh, as it was in Taiwan. I actually came uh, back to Taiwan uh, uh, at the end of April. I was, I was in Taiwan in December of 2019 and January 2020. Then I went back to Poland for a project and I got stuck. All the flights were cancelled and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't come back to Taiwan. I was fortunate enough to, to get a ride back to Taiwan uh, at the end of, 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 of April and I had to uh, stay in a quarantine. I was very tightly monitored by the Taiwanese uh, authorities during my uh, 14 day quarantine, which was, um, uh, which was uh, tough because this was the first time I had to be locked in the uh, in four walls for such a long period of time. But I have survived, but I think it's absolutely crucial that people, people take it seriously and follow uh, the quarantine measures and obviously fighting, um, fighting the, the, the fake news and mis, uh, misinformation is also very important because in, especially in Europe and, and, and probably the States as well, we have a lot of conspiracy theories. There's a lot of people who don't believe in COVID-19, don't believe in the virus, and, and, and think that this is just a hoax. Uh, moving forward, uh, working with Taiwan as a solid and trustworthy international partner. As I mentioned, I have been a part of this effort uh, between Taiwan and Poland in um, April and May. That's, that's me on the, on the picture, by the way, loading up Polish National Airlines lot flights from Taipei to Poland with med medical equipment, with a PPE, um, which, was, which was absolutely crucial at that time. Taiwan has really helped Poland. We were securing the, the national stockpile at that time, which was pretty much empty, and there was no PPE in Poland. So um, we have managed to negotiate with the Taiwanese uh, sites and and we have actually operated four flights in total between Taipei and, and Warsaw, uh, full of, 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 of um, medical, uh, uh, medical supplies. Uh, we were sending the passenger planes empty to Taipei and loading up with, with stuff and sending back full aircraft uh, with, 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 with the PPE. So this was absolutely um, uh, crucial at that time for our medical workers uh, in the hospitals and also the military, which was helping at that time to be fully secured with the highest level of the Made in Taiwan PPE. So thank you very much for that. So that will be the end of my presentation. I think uh, Poland can really learn from Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jaskula. And we would now like to proceed to our se uh, second session focusing on green energy. And we would first like to welcome Mr. Lin Junshu, PhD, uh, PhD Research Fellow and Deputy Director of Center for Green Economy, Zhonghua Institution for Economy Research. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Su Lin. I'm with the Center for Green Economy of uh, CIER, which is a think tank in Taiwan. Today, I would like to share some experiences of Taiwanese industry, especially uh, in 
uh, circular economy uh, with the focus in uh, on with a focus on recycling and green energy, which is not a very big part of circular economy, but very essential to circular economy in Taiwan and also around the world. And first of all, I would like to do a, lot, a little bit of introduction about my organization. My organization is a leading think tank in Taiwan since uh, 1981. And so we are celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. And my Center for Green Economy is the youngest uh, division in CIER, uh, which is uh, established in uh, 2013, and with about 30 people working on uh, all kinds of uh, green issues. Okay, so some basics about Taiwan uh, in waste management. Uh, right now, all of the trash, okay, uh, except for recycling, uh, is going to uh, incinerators. 95% of the, the trash is going to incinerators, but with only 5%. Uh, is in going to landfill sites. And in the past about 30 years, the recycling rate just coming up, uh, keep coming up. And right now, the recycling rate in Taiwan is about 60%. Okay, this, this picture, this slide is a little bit old, but the number right now is about 60% of the trash is being recycled. And every day, every one every citizen is producing less than uh, 0.5 uh, kilo ground of the trash uh, for incineration or landfilling. Okay, here is some uh, numbers for uh, selected products. So how can we do this? Okay, how can we achieve this status? Uh, basically, it's relying on regulations, environmental regulations in the past several years, several decades, I should say. Okay, between uh, 1980, uh, 1980 to 2020, right now, so for about 40 years. And I can cut it into half. But before 2000, and all uh, waste management is in a proper treatment uh, concept. But after that, the recycling kicks in. So we do a lot of uh, regulations. Uh, for example, we have to separate our trash into three categories, like general waste, and the kitchen waste, and the recyclable. And I, I think everyone in Taiwan know how we should do this every day, every night, and to, to dump the trash into the trucks according to which category it's belonging, belonging in. And for the giant articles, we can also reserve the service for keep up, pick up. Okay, so you just uh, put your uh, large uh, furnace or your uh, appliances uh, in front of your, 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 your house. And in the, uh, in the evening, and the, the environmental uh, people will come to pick them up in the next day morning. And we have to use the you need the price uh, bags to dump our trash. So you have to pay when you are dumping the trash somehow. And we have three incinerators in the city of Taipei, but mostly they are in the idle city situation because we are in the lack of trash to burn which is very different from what we have seen in South Asia or uh, East Asia, uh, or South Asia. And they are looking for a lot of solutions for uh, trash to energy. Okay, so because of the regulations and the programs we have in Taiwan, a lot of industries are coming out uh, with, uh, with the program and the regulations. And for example, the pet bottles in Taiwan uh, a lot of people, a lot of companies are trying to, uh, are making uh, fabric by utilizing pet bottles. Also, in 2018, a soccer game, 32, soccer team, the team, 32 national teams in the soccer game, uh, the football game, the World Cup football game, okay, 16 of the 32 are wearing the jerseys with the fabric made in Taiwan. Okay, and I believe the team of Poland probably very likely uh, were also wearing the jerseys from Taiwan. And you can uh, find a very beautiful building in the city of Taipei, uh, which has been there for 10 years already since 2010. It's uh, built by uh, pet bottles also. And pet bottle also can be baked into blankets, etc. And a lot of victories are, tr are uh, transforming
high-end uh, high, high appliances in, uh, at home or uh, for the construction materials again. And this one, is, this, this photo is showing the company is uh, making uh, very light formed glasses, glass, uh, sorry, formed, uh, formed uh, bricks from LCD glasses. Okay, so the glass can be transformed into very high value uh, materials. And more companies are working on retrieving the precious metals from e-waste. And right now we have 15 factories in Taiwan are doing this. So aside from the recycling, uh, in the, uh, the, the region of uh, green, uh, green energy, and Taiwan is the second in the, in the world uh, in uh, photovoltaic industry. We produce a lot of solar panels, solar majors, etc. And right now, the Taiwan is very into offshore wind, uh, offshore wind energy uh, development. So a lot of companies are supporting the leading companies around the world who come to Taiwan to the investment. And so the uh, supply chain in Taiwan is very strong for wind industry also. And LED lighting industry is also ranked at number two, second to China, like the solar PV, second to China. And the in production and also in the, in the value of the, the whole production. And we also have a very strong hydrogen and fuel cell industry. And probably you don't uh, have too much idea about hydrogen and fuel cell. And hydrogen and fuel cell is somehow uh, was uh, uh, selected as the uh, tech technology for the Olympic game in Tokyo this year. Supposedly, you will see a lot of demonstrations over there, but unfortunately, we cannot see that maybe until next year. All right, uh, electric, electrical vehicle industry is also very strong, and, and most importantly, uh, information systems, communication, computer technology is uh, somehow, uh, in, somehow the, the key to integrating all of the technology together to provide good solutions. Okay, for example, we have uh, some problem with the, in the stability of renewable energy supply. And how about we can combine it together, combine the different technology together and put them into under a, ben, a very efficient uh, energy management system. Oh, that's uh, somehow what Taiwan is good about. Okay, so all of them are happening in Taiwan. So we have a very strong industry in recycling and also in renewable energies. And here is an example, we, a project we have done in uh, the past several years. We put everything together into an independent power station and send that, in, send that to, uh, to the United States for demonstration. And this station is still functioning in California uh, right now, okay, in the, Palms, the city of Palm Springs, if you have, a, uh, have some idea and you have some, uh, some, uh, some idea about the location you and you have some connection, if you are going to there in the future, you are very welcome to visit uh, this station. Okay, so what's the next? Nowadays, circular economy is a very sexy term in Taiwan. And we are thinking, what we are thinking behind the policy, we should increase the value added from what we have been doing in the past several decades. For example, from waste to high quality, high valued products, how we can do this and how we can find the good markets for them. That's what we are thinking about. And this one is another example. That's a uh, solar panel making industry. There are, is a lot of sludge coming out from the pro pro production of solar panels. And what we can do about the sludge? Okay, so quite a few companies are working on transform, transforming the sludge into silicon ingots. And that's a very essential uh, element for steel industry, steel making industry. And in addition to this, we have a very strong semiconductor industry in Taiwan, as you have been knowing about this. And they are also trying to do uh, waste from semiconductor uh, industry and make them into very high value materials. But how we can find the market will be another question. Okay, and circular economy is uh, promoted by the government, by different agencies, 
And here is some is one example. Uh, it's from the EPA Environmental Protection Administration and in production consumption waste management on the market for secondary materials. There are a lot of those programs are going on right now. But what can business side can uh, what can business side achieve uh, the circular economy? Right now, Taiwan needs some guidelines for industries, and as we have seen a lot of uh, guidelines in Europe. I think that guidelines can provide some ideas for Taiwanese business, also for Taiwanese governments also. And we like to break out, okay, or, or tackle the limitations on technology and people, all industries need some financing and marketing mechanisms and also inter-industrial cooperations. So my organization is uh, working on a program called Taiwan Security, Taiwan Circular Economy Awards. And it's not just a competition, it's a platform to combine all industry sectors together, come out very good solutions, good policies, and we hope we can find good markets for them. And this one is a, another alliance, it's called Taiwan Alliance for C2C. And so what we are thinking about the cooperation uh, between Poland and Taiwan. A domestic and a global green economy network is very uh, necessary, okay? And it's not just for technology exchange or product service trade, but it's also about investment and technology exchange and a lot of policy, uh, policy and program and research, etc. So I hope we can uh, work on that together in the future. And Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lin. We thank Lin Fu Chairman. And next, we would like to welcome Dr. Joanna uh, Guchiska, head of Division of Strategy Research, Mineral and Energy Economy Research Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Dr. Guchiska, please. Uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, and thank you very much for the, for the invitation to this session. Uh, it's a very important subject in our economy also for Poland. Uh, I don't know if I can share the press screen or, or, or uh, I have prepared the presentation which, we can, which can be shared uh, for me. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this. I have prepared the presentation about the Just Transition Fund, which is a chance for a green, uh, a green energy generation in Poland. And this is the new fund, which is in line with the uh, uh, EU climate and circular economy policy. Uh, so uh, this uh, the circular economy policy is is uh, now a very important subject for, as we could see also for the uh, for the Taiwan policy. So the, with the Green Deal, we uh, Europe try to become uh, the first climate neutral continent for the world. And the COP decoding growth. This is the, the 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 most important subject for this. So decoupling growth from the prosperity. So decoupling from consumption of finite finite resources. And European Parliament endorsed net zero greenhouse gas emission objectives uh, in March 2019. And uh, European Union submit long-term strategy on climate change. So the coupling GDP from greenhouse gases is a now worldwide policy, and Poland, which is based on coal, is, um, is it, this is a challenge, but this is the also opportunity for new investment and for uh, all the action connected connected with 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 this. Uh, and uh, with the decoupling, uh, we also focusing on uh, the um, on the all the activities connected with uh, the UNEP resources. So UNEP uh, is uh, a UNEP resource panel presenting the uh, how how to, what's the possibility of decoupling of natural resources use and environmental impact from economic activities and human well-being, also focusing on uh, fossil fuel, which fossil fuel extraction was 
now is uh, two times uh, more higher than in 2000, uh, in 2017 than in uh, 1970. That's why the climate neutral in EU legislation is so active and uh, also in Poland where we have uh, uh, a lot of workers uh, still uh, active coal mine but we have and we uh, we have a vision for climate no for climate no neutrality and for transformation so what's what's the idea it's to maximize the benefit of energy efficiency a deployment of renewables and use of electricity to fully decarbonization and bars clean and safe mobility and a circular economy which was mentioned already as a key enabler to reduce greenhouse gases a developed small, smart network bioeconomy and such investment and for this uh, activities uh, is proposed by european commission just transition fund and this just transition fund idea is that nobody left behind and uh, the support for investment uh, connecting with productive and sustainable investment in, for sme creation of new companies creation of the social infrastructure uh, research and innovation uh, regeneration of decontaminate sites enhancing circular economy a social and public service upskilling reskilling training and the others so uh, with this fund which we hope will be uh, allocated to poland and allocated to małopolska region uh, it will be the accelerator for the new investment uh, in cooperation uh, with many companies and uh, uh, cooperation also with science and which create the new workplace and which create uh, such innovation solution uh, within the circular economy which was presented uh, uh, before uh, for, for, for the energy so just transition fund is really dedicated to the coal mining to the coal region that, that will be six region in Poland one is where I live, so it's Małopolska, of course Silesia region, but also Dolnośląskie region and uh, Łódzkie, so, so where we have the, the uh, operation, the coal operation. So transition from mining to renewable energy, it should be in holistic way because we are not talking only about the miners, the mining people, but we are talking about transition people to, to the more entrepreneurship, to invite SME, to invite new circular economy solution. So hoping we can uh, have some more clever and uh, very well organized system in Małopolska which we which uh, will be for which the innovative company will be invited for invest here here in Poland within support of different different funds uh, it, this is the um, just transition fund it's a uh, it's it's for as i said mentioned already it's for coal region in uh, uh, coal region and coal in europe is now mined in 31 region within 11 eu countries so this is um, the, the tools there are a lot of tools for transition strategies and also providing uh, materials uh, and some solution for this carbon intensive uh, uh, jobs and fossil fuel industries. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, here in Małopolska, uh, we are now working on the strategy, uh, what kind of investment we, would be the most welcome here, in which territory uh, it, it will be, and it's mostly focusing on the uh, on the western part in uh, in in Małopolska. We know also that just transition as an idea is a global aspect. So nobody left behind solidarity, good project, good program, and uh, with a, a lot of uh, um, uh, circular economy. I hope circular economy solution 
as you proposed, uh, as you uh, also developed in in Taiwan. So it's from one side the future in which environment is protected, but economy is trivialing. Workers need sustainable industrial policy, and uh, more people understand this. And uh, when we make the analysis about the attractiveness on investment, the environmental investment or solution. Uh, like creating a new product uh, from waste, like virtualization of economy, like industrial symbiosis, is uh, really welcome and needed in our in our region. So, just transition in Poland in a green economy. What we are talking it's about uh, money uh, which could uh, be obtained from the. European Union funds in the period 2021-2027, and uh, uh, from uh, direct from Just Transition is about two billion money for investment in Poland. This is the capping from this fund, but uh, there are much, much more um, money we are now uh, discussing in on the level of European Union. But uh, especially fund which was created for for this region, it's uh, the, uh, it's the, um, it's for the, for this for this region in in transition, uh, and Poland is ready for this as we submitted uh, energy plan and climate. Uh, the ministry prepared a draft for energy policy. And also uh, the uh, Polish Union Employment and Government reached last an agreement in September to phase out coal mine by 2049. So we could see that uh, the new investment, the new solution is really welcome on, uh, especially on this region like Śląsk, Małopolska, Wielkopolskie, Łódzkie and Lubelskie. So more about my region, Małopolska is a first region dedicated plan for climate change and adoption. Uh, and um, this, uh, we have a very good examples and very good experience from life uh, project which we have here. So as you know, the Kraków is one of the, or, or one of the most polluted a city now it's uh, also with COVID what we mentioned, but also due to this uh, effective uh, activities of our uh, regional authority and also uh, in the Krakow city, a lot of investment uh, for band the call, for, for changing uh, the, uh, developing the network system for heating and uh, other solution. Uh, we have uh, the, 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 the air in Krakow is much better. Uh, a lot of startup with the in cooperation with the science uh, has also created a new solution. We have now a live project which called Eco Małopolska and it will be implemented uh, in the field of climate change mitigation. Uh, so a lot of possibility for cooperation is really um, welcome in this in this region and uh, also with the big companies which are active in this area like Tauron, Sintos and, and the other. Uh, what is also important in this field is that um, uh, we have to take it into account that if we not uh, a transfer to the uh, to the uh, more cleaner energy. The price from the um, energy from non-renewable resources will be higher because a lot of mechanism in Europe is foreseen, like carbon taxes or carbon prices. Uh, so uh, if it would be like this, uh, that that's, uh, from one side uh, it's important to invest in new green energy, not to be punished, but the higher price uh, of the uh, energy from non-renewable sources due to different taxes and different prices which can cause to the energy poverty. And uh, so uh, there are from two sides uh, the possibility for enhancing to the new investment in uh, in in uh, renewable energy and in circular economy or in green economy. 
uh, what we can offer here and uh, in, in our region and in Poland, uh, for sure there is a, a, a well-developed uh, science um, uh, universities. We also created uh, uh, the Highway to Technology of Innovation Institute, which is the largest virtual institute in Poland with over 50 universities and large companies, each called YATI, and we hope for cooperation. Uh, in Małopolska region is the uh, Academy of Mining uh, Science, um, AGH, so modern technical university with a lot of startups, with also important centers for development and transfer of innovative technology. We had already very good cooperation and it's still going on with the cluster waste management and the recycling cluster, key national cluster with Poland with over 100 companies, mainly SME, and, um, and also Institute of Polish Academy of Science. So I hope for closer cooperation. I hope for cooperation within the new uh, possible fund within the European Union, and uh, that uh, we develop the, the solution which will be in line with circular economy and in line with just transition idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kuczyska. And next, we would like to welcome Ms. Sunny Lee, Senior Sales Manager of Electronic Vehicle Charging Solutions from Delta Electronics. Ms. Lee, please. Okay, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Okay, today my topic is the next generation EV charging infrastructure. Actually, I, I was the one who initiated the idea of stepping into EV charging business uh, like uh, 12 years ago at Delta. And at one event in Europe, like 10 years ago, um, I know I was, I was presenting a business plan uh, with all my European colleagues. And then I raised a question to the audience. How many of you are driving an EV now? Okay, that's my audience here today. But at that event, only one raised his hand. And then I asked him, what brand are you driving? He said, I'm driving an e-scooter. So it's not even an EV. But now we can see that more and more people are driving EV, and EV is already a big trend nowadays, but not a decade ago. So that is the reason why we paved a long way to make this EV charging business work. Okay, so um, a complete charging infrastructure should include uh, three different charging scenarios. The first one is the charging at home, uh, or we call it slow charging, normally ranging from four to eight hours. So uh, normally happens at house, in your apartment or in multi-dwelling workplaces. And then, uh, let me try this one. Oh, sorry. Okay. And then uh, normal charging between one to four hours. Uh, so that is uh, sometimes we call it DC destination. It happens in retails and maybe hotels at your workplace or some fleets, like the logistic fleets, where they charge their cars at their company. And then uh, emergency charging, which happens normally at highways or some parking lots or uh, spe specifically, um, particularly the EV charging stations. And the charging time is normally within 30 minutes. 
Okay, the rationale why people won't adapt EV nowadays are several reasons. The first one is cost, because the price of an EV normally higher than a, a, a combustion engine cars. Um, I think that depends on the EV makers to try to use advanced battery technology to decrease the cost and also rely on the governments to impose incentives or stimu uh, stimulation plans to encourage the EV adaption. Uh, the, other, the other main reason is that the drivers they used to have, they, they tend to have the driving range anxiety uh, because the charging infra is not very complete in the market. So EV drivers, they normally worry about their, um, the, the battery, whether can sustain, can support them to the next destination. So I think that people, uh, the EV drivers normally when they got to a destination, if there is an EV charger available, they just used to plug in the EV car. So to address this issue, the EV makers, they try to enlarge the battery size of the EV. So uh, by enlarging the battery size, which means the charging hour could be longer. So here's the trend, because the, uh, because the EV maker, they try, to enjoy, uh, they try to boost the driving range, so the batteries are higher, uh, bigger, and then the onboard charger also size is bigger, the capacity is bigger. So that we need uh, higher power DC charging, directly uh, power charge the battery on the car. And also for the home charging, that we also need higher power, because if you don't have a uh, a higher power AC charger. If you have an 80 kilowatt hour battery car, then you have to charge it at home more than 10 hours, which is not bearable either. So we also need to increase the AC charging capacity. And uh, because uh, the power, the charging power increased, means that there will be a big demand of power like in my house, my electricity bill is, uh, well, I, I used to, I use like 80 kilowatt hour per month in summer where I turn on, when I turn on my air conditioning. But a battery car, simply, you know, they can have uh, like 80 kilowatt hour. That means charging it one time to full, that would be the bill that you pay for a month. So imagine that everybody at home or at work or at night at a certain period of time, they, stick, they uh, charge the car at the same time. There will be big impact to the, the electricity that you, you have at home or at the building or even uh, in the city. So then we see a trend for the V2X, that is the um, the vehicle to could be the vehicle to load, or could be the vehicle to home, or vehicle to building, or even the vehicle to grid. They can do the bi-directional charging. What we are talking about now is the charging uh, single uh, one direction from the AC to uh, from the charger to the vehicle. But now we can use this car here as a virtual power plant. So uh, we can charge the car, not in the peak hour, but when you need the power, you can discharge the car and the transmit the power to the load, to the home, or to the grid. So this is bi-directional charging. And we need also an energy storage system to somehow do the uh, peak shaving to smooth the power so that we don't have a big impact at a certain period of time. And also we can leverage the renewable energy like the solar power systems, even wind power systems, uh, integrated into the e-mobility 
infrastructure. And um, there are the other innovations in the world, like uh, everything integrated together, all-in-one integration, and like wireless charging. Now we have to, what we are using now is the conductive charging, where you have to park your car at certain parking lots, and then you have to uh, uh, plug in the, the, your car to the EV charger, um, but which is takes more you know, time and uh, with the autonomous driving, you know, autonomous cars where you know, the cars, they don't need you to drive to sit on the driver's seat to really drive the car. Sometimes you can just you know, let it go and they will just go to the, the place or park it exactly the same, exactly precisely to receive the wireless charging. So um, these are the new innovations on the world. So amazing, like 10 years ago, we are not talking about these trends. 10 years ago, we were talking about the unification of the charging standards and the interoperability between the EV charger and the EVs and the inter interoperability between the EV charging network and the uh, charging operation backend systems. But now we are talking about this new trends so this will make the infrastructure uh, complete. So this is a virtual uh, illustration of how these devices are connected together. So we can see here that uh, there is the, the renewable power, renewable energy, which we can have for like PV and uh, wind power. And with the power generated, we can have uh, the energy storage system to store the power. And all these devices are connected to the energy management system. And uh, the charger is the load. So we can use it to singly charge the car or use the V2X charger to discharge the car when, whenever it's needed. Okay, so um, there is one category of a charging scenario, which is the public charging. And public charging draws a lot of power from the grid. And uh, for the public charging, there are two scenarios. The first one is the uh, power cabinets. We see here, uh, they just built just behind the charging, charging sites and then we have the uh, dispensers. So like uh, this could be up to 350 to uh, 600 kilowatt or even higher. And then we have uh, distributed uh, dispensers which may have like 25 kilowatt output per unit. And we can have an emergency dispenser which has higher power if you want to charge it within like 10 minutes. So this is kind of a scalable charging infra that we can build. And the other kind of a charger is a one charger to one vehicle. In that sense that we can have a, a like a 200 kilowatt or even a 350 kilowatt charger, uh, one or two charging outlets, and uh, a 25 kilowatt DC charger, uh, same that one or two charging outlets to the to the EV. And all this, again, can be connected to the site management system to get the power source from the PV inverter or the um, energy storage systems. And the chargers have to be connected because uh, this is, everything is on the internet, everything is connected, right? This is AIoT world. So, um, the charges can be connected to the meters. So the, there is advanced metering infra and also the uh, lighting systems. Uh, actually, sorry, the lighting systems or uh, including the, uh, the chargers, everything is connected to this uh, network. So this is a, a, a charging um, infra that is uh, with a smarter functions so that we can manage uh, at what time 
or uh, the power can be uh, delivered to what device? Okay, and this is the Delta Energy Infrastructure Solution. So you can see that um, above this line, these are the power generation or power transmission. And here we have uh, different scenarios for the factories, for the commercial building, and for the residential, the uh, residential units. So um, every for every scenario, we have the uh, renewable energy systems, we have the uh, power conditioning systems, or we have the chargers, uh, different ratings, capacities, uh, suitable for different scenarios. Okay, so Delta was established in 1971. We are a um, Fortune 500 company. We are a multinational corporation headquartered in Taiwan. We have more than 800, sorry, 80,000 uh, employees worldwide. And uh, we have different uh, business units. Uh, EV charging is one of them, uh, but we have also the ICT industry where we do the data center power supplies and we do the telecom power supplies. We have the industrial automation systems, and uh, we have the building automation systems and display and monitoring systems. And also, as Dr. Chen just mentioned, we also are in the medical industry as well. All right, and then, uh, then uh, the EV charging in Poland. So here we see the EV charging policy in Poland, it's quite, quite clear that uh, Polish government just targets to have one million EV by the end of 2025. And now uh, we have uh, 14, almost 14,000, which means 700% growth in the coming years. Okay, and in, uh, for Delta, we have been cooperating with our partners in Poland to build the infrastructure of EV charging. And uh, we have some successful stories here to share with you that uh, we are working with Greenway, which is a very important partner of Delta. Uh, they are a charging point operator uh, who help in to uh, install Delta's chargers in different, um, in different uh, uh, for, for different customers, different uh, industries. So we see that they have their own charging lots and they also help uh, here some enterprises to build their charging network. And we also work with Olin, which is a Polish uh, oil and gas company uh, for, their, for their charging facility. And we also work with the other companies like uh, PGE and also Ministry of uh, Climate and also some EV makers, including Audi and um, I believe we also do for Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz. And these are the other success cases in Europe. Uh, we do for the car dealers in Sweden and uh, we have a commercial applic application in the Netherlands. We built this for, for Hyatt. And uh, we, have, uh, we built the chargers for the charge point operators uh, in Germany and uh, in Slovakia, in Norway. All right, and our investments in Poland, that is only for the EV charging business unit alone. So, uh, we have an EV charging R&D center based in Poland. Actually, we have that organization for more than 10 years um, because we know that uh, Poland is an industrial country and we have a lot of talents there, easy to get the talents in uh, electrical and electronic industries. And uh, our fast charger, ultra fast chargers are designed and developed in Poland, which is at uh, 150 kilowatts up to 350 kilowatt high power DC charger. And we 
So far, we have over 150 ultra-fast chargers installed in Poland since 2017. Okay, um, so this is a photo taken uh, with uh, Mr. Mikhail Kurtaka. I think you know him very well, right? Uh, who was the host of this uh, Sustainable Innovation Forum in 2018. And uh, so this photo was taken at the event together with Mr. Uh, Kurtaka. We have our Vice President, Mr. Victor Chen, and our uh, chairman, Vice Chairman of the Delta Electronic Foundation, uh, Ms. Guo. Uh, together. So at this event, Delta was invited to share our experience in, in, in enabling the low carbon transportation. And this, this forum actually was very important. It's an affiliated event of COP24. So this addresses the climate-related uh, uh, issues in the world. So this, that is the Delta. We hope that we can work with all of you together to make the world greener and smarter. And welcome to the e-mobility era. Thank you. Thank you. We thank Ms. Lee for her uh, insightful presentation. And next, we would like to welcome Ms. Michael Moskowiec, Vice President of Rafaco IBAS. Mr. Moskowiec, please. Good afternoon, Good morning, Poland. My name is Michal Maciekowiak, and uh, I'm the founder of OZ, the vice president of the company of Makoi Bus. We are the producer of electric buses in Poland. Uh, and uh, recently, like two months ago, uh, we have been acquired by uh, the industrial development agency at the time. So uh, today we are 100% owned by the Polish state and Polish government. So this is uh, the update, which I think is very important in terms of our business. Um, we have prepared a short uh, presentation uh, for you and also a short movie. Uh, so I will just present it in a minute. In the meantime, I would like to say that uh, we have also, for the last four months when we have been developing the project, uh, we have been able to make a strong bond uh, with a few of Taiwanese companies, um, also including Delta. So I would add like another success, Ms. Sunny Lee, that also my prototypes of the electric bus are running on your uh, cells uh, from Delta. So uh, I would add it as a, another bond between our uh, two companies and, and uh, two nations. Uh, so uh, let me briefly just share the presentation and uh, I will try to share the content. All right. So as I said, uh, two months ago, we have been acquired by uh, industrial Development Agency, um, uh, which is right now strongly supporting us in terms of uh, the further growth of the company. Uh, but firstly, may, may I say about the project itself. Uh, the project itself like, is a niche project in 8.5 meters long. Uh, we decided that we will start the business with this kind of the model. Uh, the main technical assumption are that uh, we have two types of batteries included, so NMC and LTO. Uh, so NMC, of course, for um, slow charging, overnight charging, LTO for fast charging by a pantograph with 15 minutes up to 90%. Mm. We have central synchronous motor with permanent magnets. And so what is important, it uh, also are the dimensions of the bus because the height is only 3.2 meters, uh, which is the best in its class, actually. And here are the main features that we can uh, tell about the bus. So this is actually the first bus uh, in, in Europe that battery is entirely in the chassis because our approach was that uh, we would like to make it li like a Tesla style, let's say. So uh, we don't have any batteries on the roof. 
And so we designed actually the um, bus from the scratch as a purely electric vehicle. That is why we have been able to achieve all those results that uh, we can present today. And uh, thanks to that, uh, and thanks to also the dimensions of the of the vehicle, uh, we have a great maneuverability, and uh, we have been able, able to improve the traction parameters and also drive safety. We have been mostly also focusing on the uh, reduction of weight. Uh, we have been able to reduce the weight uh, more than 10% in terms of the competition. Uh, LTO cells, I already have uh, said, so we have like uh, two technologies for the batteries. Of course, we have stainless steel frame and polyester laminates uh, for the safety and for the lightweight of the vehicle. And uh, what is also important, the vehicle is adapted to carry uh, disabled people and depends on the uh, structure of the interior. It can be either one or even more uh, places for the disabled people. When it comes to applications, we have like actually three models right now. Uh, the first model is that you see is that the city version of this bus has been in operations for more than one year. And uh, this is for suburban uh, and uh, areas mostly uh, with onboard charger. Uh, the second version, which uh, actually going to have a premiere this, this month, it's already uh, done, but due to the COVID-19, we have been uh, pushed to postpone the, the premiere. It's the school version of our electric bus. And this is the only bus in Poland and in Europe that is actually uh, homologated and have all the certificates um, which, require, which are required for the transportation of children. So this is something that we are very proud of and we will present it this month uh, later. And uh, maybe coming back, also the third version is this uh, also city version, but for strictly city centers. So this will be actually the previous version, but with, but with LTO batteries uh, and uh, with uh, fast charging via pantograph. So uh, going uh, further, what makes our uh, bus innovative uh, uh, is basically lightweight design. Mm, and as I said, uh, we have put a lot of effort to develop this from the scratch. And uh, that is why we have been able to achieve all the parameters that uh, we wanted. Also the small dimensions of the vehicle, which means that it is very good for the city centers, uh, but also for the suburban areas, because what is important to mention, uh, we got like 65 passengers that can fit into the bus uh, which is not much less than in the 10 or 12 meter buses that you have already today on the market. We have battery in the chassis, so um, we don't have any batteries on the roof. That is why the bus is actually um, uh, so uh, good in terms of the height. Uh, but only, also thanks to that, we have 100% low floor entrance, which is uh, quite a nice feature in terms of uh, having all the batteries in the chassis. And of course, we have modular construction uh, of the battery packs and which will allow us to easily replace them with more modern or more advanced technologies uh, once they appear on the market. We have also created together with our engineers in Poland, our own engine, um, PMSM engine. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, something that uh, we wanted to be you know, as much as independent as, as possible from, from other um, market players. When it comes to the construction of the vehicle, you can see it right now, um, how does it look? Um, so I think that all these features that I've been telling, um, um, you can just see here on the picture. Uh, and this is where we have placed the batteries, so it shows that the entire batteries are in the floor. And uh, actually, uh, thanks to that, uh, we have been able to lower the center of gravity of the bus, uh, which of course improved the driving stability and uh, also the modular construction of the battery packs allow us to place them in different uh, um, places on the floor. Uh, this is our uh, battery pack for LTO and NMC batteries. What is important, uh, we have done LTO and NMC in one pack. So we are just uh, changing the interior of the pack, but the pack itself, which was also designed purely for us uh, because it, it's not from the shelf, 
Uh, so um, thanks to that, we have actually the possibility of having two technologies. The motor, synchronous motor with permanent magnets also uh, made by our engineers with Institute in Poland, uh, in Sosnowiec, in Katow near Katowice. This, uh, these are the features of the, of the, um, of the motor. Uh, as you can see, the efficiency is 90%, 96% of this motor. Uh, and uh, when it comes to other uh, benefits, uh, you can see the whole structure on the screen. And the light, lightweight construction, we have been able to lower the mass of the vehicle, which means that we can add either five additional passengers or we can increase the range of 10% if we add some more batteries to the bus. Uh, location of the batteries, it's uh, again, also these features that uh, we can charge the bus in 15 minutes and the cycles are more than 10,000 when it comes to the um, years of operation of the, of the battery in the bus. So uh, that would be all for this. Uh, uh, I was uh, listening very carefully and I'm glad that also Taiwan is making electrification of, of the fleet. And uh, from this place, I would like to um, say that we are very open for the, any cooperation with uh, Taiwan and Taiwanese companies or municipalities. Uh, from this uh, perspective, I can also say that the Polish government, which is supporting us, for sure will be also happy to uh, explore more opportunities between other our countries and also between uh, my company and all the companies in Taiwan. Uh, so that would be great if uh, there will be some outcome, uh, positive outcome uh, and positive cooperation in the future. So thank you for the presentation. And uh, at the end, I will just like share uh, like a one, uh, one minute movie actually. Mm, just give me a second, please. So it was lovely to see you all the gentlemen and I uh, hope uh, you will all stay safe. We can be able to see each other next week face-to-face, uh, -face, either in Taiwan or in Poland. Thank you, okay, thank you. Thank you Mr. Maskoviec. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will proceed to our QA session and due to a time limit, we will first like to invite our VIPs at front to come up with their questions. 我们现在进入贵宾交流时间，那么碍于时间限制，我们首先邀请前排专家代表提问。Any one of one of the work we have done is just on time, so we have several minutes for you to have the questions. Oh, our uh, on the uh, panel, would you, would you have some any questions? Is that, oh yeah, Mr. Rich, 
Yes, I would like just to thank all the participants uh, for their very interesting uh, presentations. I see that we have a very good, already some very good cooperation, especially in the field of uh, electromobility, <coughs> yes, we, with Delta and Rafaco. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank other speakers for bringing up very important topics uh, of green energy and, and medical and healthcare. Uh, I'm really glad that we managed to, this, to make this happen despite the COVID-19 and still uh, and still meet uh, and 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 and, uh, and deliver the presentations. Uh, I hope that next year we we can also have a face-to-face -face networking session, so we can meet each other personally and uh, and exchange ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Switch on and wait for three minutes, three seconds. Yeah. Wait, wait. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a we have a question. Um, that is, uh, the chargers communication for buses and trucks are unique to its suppliers, and integration would be necessary with major charger manufacturers. So um, our question to Rafaco is that uh, what is the approach of Rafaco for the integration of vehicle with the charger? And will Rafaco roll out ISO 15118 and by when? And uh, what is the methodology of charger manufacturer to integrate with Rafaco vehicle and smoothly supporting the integration activity, whether it is uh, Chademo or CCS? Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, actually, I'm really glad we are here together because uh, it would be great actually to make some follow up after the the forum that we have because right now we are in a um, period where we are actually um, choosing um, the contractors or our suppliers for the chargers because it is like very common or very often in Poland that uh, whenever we are going to the tender we need to have together with us the supplier of the chargers and the charger system. Uh, we are mostly right now uh, using CCS2 and this is the main standard uh, um, and yeah but uh, as, as i said you know uh, we have like in, in one of type one of the types of our pro product we have uh, onboard chargers and uh, sometimes we just have to deliver the whole infrastructure to the to the clients so uh, that would be great if we, we could follow afterwards and uh, maybe we could discuss it uh, in more details together thank you Okay, yeah, I have a question for Joanna. Yeah, you mentioned about carbon tax in Europe, and I just wonder what's the impact on industry side, uh, especially uh, in domestically in Poland, or uh, if the, the products is exported to other countries in, in Europe, or other countries in, uh, outside of Europe, and what would, uh, do they need to pay the carbon tax, and also for the industry from outside of Europe and uh, when they trying to sell something to Europe do they have to pay carbon uh, carbon tax or carbon tariff something like that and what's the different differentiation for the industry mm -hmm. uh, thank you thank you very much for this question it's really it's really very important because uh, now we could see that um, the carbon pricing it's mostly it's mostly in Europe uh, because it's explicit carbon taxing uh, in some in some countries in Europe so but it's also emission trading system and with this emission trading system it's Europe it create that it will have impact on the on the price uh, it could have an impact on the price of of energy 
And uh, there are more and more countries which put uh, different uh, instruments uh, that impose on, that has an impact on the, on the cost here. So ETS system, a type and trade system, this is the, the mostly, uh, the mostly focusing on the investment in Europe. And that's why I think that new, uh, new, uh, new investment in clean energy and what I like the best, especially uh, from my perspective, the, the possibilities, uh, what you have done, looking in the value chain, so recycling of panel, the circular economy of, of um, uh, renewable energy facilities. This is something what is now crucial for develop, uh, for develop further the renewable energy. So, conclusion, uh, carbon pricing mostly on changing the investment uh, in Europe and uh, it's uh, because we have a lot of type of carbon uh, pr uh, pricing, fuel, fuel taxes, ETS system, uh, different tax system, regulation like this. So, in Europe, uh, investment and in Poland especially for renewable energy, I think would be welcome and would be support a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank our Vice Chairman Huang and all speakers for sharing such informative ideas and insightful point of view with us today. And our meeting is officially now adjourned. Thank you once again. Thank you for your participation. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. 各位宾精致的会议到此告一个段落。感谢您的支持与参与您的资料带中减负本次会议播放厂商与会名单如有任何洽谈需求请于会后与我们联系那么再次提醒您敬请协助填写黄色问卷表并于离场前交给现场工作人员谢谢您我们再会